Russ is an author and pastor from Nashville, Tennessee, and we got to talk about his new book, Rembrandt is in the Wind. To quote Russ, this book is about beauty, but it's filled with stories of brokenness and how that brokenness can lead us back to God. This was an awesome conversation, and it's an even better book. Here's my talk with Russ. Well, Russ, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, your book was one of the most fascinating books I have read in a very, very long time. Thanks for saying that. You're very welcome. I, and, uh, you know, not to flatter you too much, but, you, but you're a beautiful writer. And I think for me, so I actually, when I left high school, went to college, I went for art. And um, I got scared and I gave up on that dream and I changed into biology. So full 180. So this book spoke to my heart on a very, very deep level. So just to kind of set the scene for the people that are listening to this episode, the book is really about, in my opinion, the book is about the this beauty and brokenness and God and the connection between these things. So I guess before we get into all that, can you just tell me why art? Why should people care? Why should people care about art and beauty and all of these things? Yeah, well, you know, art is a curious um, <clears throat> subject because it it's, can be so subjective. And yet, uh, in any major city in the world, there's a museum that exists just to house things that people have made uh, that have stood for centuries as um, masterpieces. And I'm fascinated by the question of what, why? Like, what, what is it that... that that causes, you know, cities and cultures to pour so much into the preservation of these paintings and sculptures that have been um, fashioned by the hands of people. And it's a very theological thing. And because, you know, when, when we understand the very opening chapters of the Bible, uh, and they talk about the creation of man, uh, in that is a discussion of the nature of God himself, that we're made in the image of God. Uh, and the very first thing we learn about God is he makes things, he, he creates. And so, and he creates with splendor and glory. And then he makes us in his image, which is unique in all of creation. Uh, and so when we go about the business of <clears throat> making art, one of the things that we're doing is we're we're um, exercising that image-bearing quality of his uh, by being sub-creators, by making things of our own in, in this kind of quest to get at something true, get at something beautiful, something that helps explain to us and um, the world around us why we're here, the significance of being alive. Um, and so, you know, so I've been drawn to art since, since I was a kid, um, had great art teachers in school, uh, who really wanted to develop in us, uh, a lifelong affection for the arts and, and gave us some good guidance for, for how to go about that. But, uh, yeah, I, art has just been, it's, it's, it's communicated to my soul, not to sound too esoteric, um, in ways that, that other things just can't do, uh, just by nature of art being what it is. I've heard art and music described as, as the language shared between all people. It's the language of God. And I, and I think that's true. I think what I loved most about your book is it... It helped me form a, I've had a lot of ideas throughout the years. You know, you see broken people or troubled people or, you know, these troubled geniuses. And I've, I've always wondered, like, why do they have that, that touch of spark that uh, these other people don't have? And I, and I couldn't formulate, you know, is, is the brokenness a part of the genius? Is the genius, you know, what is it about these people? And I, and I love that your book kind of, tied all of these pieces together. It's a coherent worldview about beauty and brokenness and, and the connection and really the beauty in brokenness, which is a, a kind of a unique perspective. So you start this book by telling the story of the statue of David. I, I wonder if you would mind sharing that story here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The statue of David is, in my opinion, I'm going to say something really ridiculous right now. Like just so go for it. Um, so feel free, listeners, to um, prove me wrong. Uh, tell me why I'm wrong about this. A um, couple caveats before I say the ridiculous thing. I'm not a person who makes lists of the greatest works of art in the world. 
Um, I'm not somebody who has like favorites. I'm more of a body of work type of person than I am. I like this particular painting or that particular painting. Um, but what I'm about to say has, has to do with the global reception to Michelangelo's David <clears throat> and the, uh, the difficulty of the medium, uh, carving marble, uh, which is in, in the world of sculpture is the most challenging kind of sculpture because it's it's a it's an act of pure subtraction you can't add back to it so if you make a mistake in the carving away there's no way to fix it um and so here's the claim <laughs> i believe that michelangelo's david is the single greatest artistic achievement by a human being in the history of the world that's the claim it's not my favorite piece of art in the world but i marvel at it because it's perfect and in ways that I have yet to find a convincing argument for something else to pull ahead of it. Um, and part of it is because he's nude. Uh, and and so if you're carving a statue and they're clothed, uh, it, it overlooks and forgives um, a lot of potential inaccuracies or mistakes in the carving. But if there is no nothing covering the, the form of the human being, for a human being to look at it, uh, we will notice immediately things that are wrong, things that are off, things that are, un, you know, just sort of uh, not the way people really are. And to look at Michelangelo's David is to see a um, as perfect a carving of a human figure uh, with nothing hidden. Um, that I can that I can think of, and five hundred years of people traveling around the world, giving up their money and vacation days to stand in front of this thing, um, in it, which has its own room, <laughs> you know, in the museum is, is, uh, is, is anyway. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the sculpture. And so I wanted to learn about it, um, and learn about how the statue came to be. And it was a really fascinating process because the the block from which that statue was carved was actually harvested from the Appian Alps um, about 40 years before Michelangelo ever touched it. <clears throat> and it was brought to Florence um, and set in the courtyard of the Duomo Cathedral um, with the intention of one day somebody carving David out of this block and it would go up on the buttress of the of the cathedral as one of 12 statues of Old Testament figures that would be up there. And two prior sculptors attempted a, a start. They didn't carve out any of the human figure, but they, they started, they took the commission and they started working on it. And that led to um, a hole being carved in the stone, which is which is where the would run between where the legs are now, um, and uh, some other <clears throat> chipping away of major areas. But but what Michelangelo inherited when he finally uh, took that contract as a, a 24 year old uh, was basically a, a a block of marble that had been waiting for somebody to carve David out of it, and he spent about four years uh, carving that statue and. Um, uh, and it was so mesmerizing to the people and, and so glorious and transcendent that they, they were like, we can't put this up on the buttress because you, you won't see it anymore. You'll see, you'll see a statue of David, but what you really need to be able to do is get up close to this thing and see, see the perfection of it. And so, um, so it ended up being put in the town square, uh, facing Rome as a, as a kind of a political statement, um, for, for the people of Florence that to, you know, they were, they were kind of assuming the posture of David to Rome's Goliath, um, at the time. And, uh, so that's, that's how that statue came to be. And, um, Michelangelo was a fascinating character because he, even though one of the things he's best known for is the Sistine Chapel ceiling, he hated painting. He, he thought painting was, was just beneath him. Um, he, he, two dimensional work just f felt like a waste of his time. Uh, and so 
you know, he, I have a couple quotes in the book about his disdain for the Sistine Chapel ceiling project, uh, which is just kind of funny to think about because that's what everybody just says. Wow. What a, what an artist. And he's like, I hated that. Um, but the sculpture was his, was his favorite and, and the challenge of, of creating something out of, out of a single block of stone, um, was a challenge that he, he knew, uh, in, in every fiber of his being that he was the best that had ever done that. And, and he was quick to tell people that too. Um, so he was, he was quite a character. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how that, that came to be. And it's a, it's a fascinating journey that it's been on and the response, the global response to that particular statue. Um, it, it, it tells the story, you know, that people will travel to the other side of the globe just to stand in the same room at it and as it and look at it. I, I loved uh, that you included. He he was kind of like um like an athlete or something. He you know when you when you get it's almost like reading about presidents. You hear about like their uh, the best parts of who they were, but then you read their biography and you realize that they're, they're just people. Mm-hmm. And and I loved him. You know, smack talking other artists. You're like, oh, you're just a painter. So yeah, it, it yeah. Was <laughs> fascinating that this this guy who is just so amazing. He's, he was a kid. He was a kid with, with ego problems and, you know, um, the problems of, of wealth and excess and all these different things he struggled, but yet he was able to create these really amazing things. So at one point in the book, you say to get at beauty, we have to get at brokenness. Well, what exactly does that mean? Part of what's happening inside of us when we encounter beauty is there's this longing for something deeper that we feel like we're coming into contact with. And so when you stand at the rim of the Grand Canyon, for example, um, you know, people who haven't been to the Grand Canyon will say, what's the big deal? It's just a big hole in the ground. But when you stand at the rim of the Grand Canyon, I defy you to say it's just a big hole in the ground. It's, it's breathtaking. And it's, and it's something that is, is, um, we stand at the edge of a Grand Canyon because there's something in us that feels like we were meant to stand in the presence of splendor and glory. And when we get an opportunity to do that, even in part, we're engaging with something that we believe intuitively, uh, instinctively is, is part of what we were made for. You know, C.S. Lewis famously said that if, if I find in myself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy then the most reasonable explanation is that I was made for another world. And I, can't, I love that thought, that when we stand in front of glory, and hu- it's because we're hungering for something even deeper, something even more perfect, something even more beautiful. It really, it's a longing for perfection, to be in the presence of complete, unadulterated glory. And that longing, that desire in us, is there because we we can't just satisfy that in ourselves because we have this brokenness in us um, that we're all limited um, by the brokenness of the world and the brokenness inside of us and so when we engage with beauty part of what we're doing is we're we're arousing an appetite for perfection uh, and that's a perfection that our hearts were made for um, since the dawn of man and so that's the connection between beauty and brokenness is is the beauty is awakening in us a desire for all that is wrong to be put right and for us to be in the presence of of perfect splendor forever that was something I had not considered before reading your book I guess on some um, you know deep level I kind of you kind of instinctively know, but I guess what was surprising about it was that for something to be beautiful, it requires the act of another. So it's like, it, there is no, even if the world existed as it is right now with beauty all over the place, animals wouldn't be able to participate in that beauty. It requires us as participants in the act of finding something beautiful, which is just a fascinating idea. Yeah, Henry Nouwen, in his book, uh, The Return of the Prodigal Son, which explores Rembrandt's painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son, he talks about beauty and brokenness. And he says, there is no beauty in brokenness except for the compassionate embrace that surrounds it. Uh, And so that picture of the prodigal son on his knees and the father's embrace, what's beautiful about that picture is not the brokenness of the prodigal son, but it's the 
that the that the broken prodigal son is enveloped in the embrace of the father who is receiving him and uh you know, you, you kind of what you were just saying is is human beings are unique in this. We're the only ones who think like this. Uh, we're the only cre- creature on earth who goes and beholds beauty for beauty's sake, um, who wrestles with um, kind of existential questions about the meaning of life when we stand in front of something that we find to be lovely or beautiful, you know, or we hear a sound that, that stirs us or takes us back. We have a nostalgia, you know, things like this. These are all longings for something transcendent that is a unique quality of human beings uh, that nothing else in creation has. Speaking of that quote, so that's that's your opening paragraph of the book. Um, I've never done this before. I read that opening paragraph to both friends and parents because I loved it so much. It is one of the most gripping open paragraphs of a book I've ever read in my entire life. So I'll commend you on specifically that paragraph because it was so touching. I was like, man, this is this is an important book. Um, but just continuing on. So what is it? What is it about? trauma or or hard things or broken parts that allows us to make transcendent art because it, it seems to me that you can make good art just from putting in the work you know you can you can kind of get in there put in the hours and make something good that touches people but to make transcendent art it seems to have to come from a place of a wound it has to come from a place of brokenness why do you think that is yeah you know, I think about this a lot. Um, I'm a pastor, and so I think a lot about when I'm speaking to my congregation. I'm, I'm always pretty mindful that I'm that that part of the way I'm speaking, part of the way my words will find them. The, I can get to the heart through a wound better than I can get to the heart through a clever turn of a phrase. You know, and and it's the way it it was. It was Jesus encounter with the woman at the well um, in John four that when he was speaking with her, they were having this kind of conversation where where she didn't really understand who she was talking to. Um, And he raised the issue of, you know, he, he talked about having water that that if she drank it, she would never thirst again. And she said, I'd, I'd love to have some of that water. Can you give it to me? And he said, go and get your husband. And she said, I, I don't have a husband. And that's when Jesus said, I, you, I know you've had four, and the man that you're with now isn't your husband. And her guard went down, but he, he got to her because she said, you must be a prophet. And that's when he started to reveal who he was to her, was he, he got to her through her pain, and he got to her through her, her brokenness. And I think transcendent art uh, is art that tells, tells the truth um, in, a, in an unapologetic way. People will ask me sometimes, um, you know, um, if you're a Christian, you know, Christians will say, how do, how do I make good Christian art? And what, what, what my standard response is, don't ever try to make Christian art. Try to make honest art. And if you make honest art, the gospel will be in it. Um, but if you just try to make Christian art, it won't come across as the Christianity of the Bible. It'll come across as something meant to inspire or something idyllic or, you know, there are certain painters out there that are kind of known for being Christian painters um, and it really does very little for me because I think, well, I, I don't, it, it feels like part of the part of the uh, agenda here is to paint an idyllic world, but we don't live in an idyllic world. We live in a world where there's a prodigal son whose shoes are falling off of his feet as he's blown through his father's inheritance and the only place he can go after he reaches the end of himself is back to the father that he that he um, disrespected and rebelled against and the result is he's wrapped up in the father's embrace I think I think art that tells that kind of story or that fully acknowledges the brokenness and the ugliness of the world that we live in um, is 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 the kind of art that people will stand in front of and say, uh, okay, this is telling me something about myself, and this is telling me something true. This is helping me um, navigate this world. So in the book, I talk about, uh, there are several chapters where um, the stories that I unpack 
uh, of these different painters. Uh, they're not admirable people at all. Uh, they're they're kind of insufferable. Some of them are probably pretty abusive. Um, and I made a commitment early on in writing this book to have no um, hagiography, which is just a fancy word for a biography of a saint. Um, hagiographies are biographies about saints written to demonstrate why they're saints. Uh, so only the good news, right? And uh, and then maybe polishing the good news quite a bit. And I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write about art that I connect with. And in the process of writing about it, I'm going to learn some of their stories. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to try to put a positive spin on anything negative that I see. And so it made certain painters, like, like Edward Hopper is one that comes to mind, and Caravaggio, um, who their, their stories are really frustrating uh, because <clears throat> they were not good people, <laughs> you know. Um, and in the process of not being good people, they created art that speaks to me about the brokenness of the world in a really profound way. Caravaggio in the way that he depicted biblical truth, uh, and Edward Hopper in the way that he depicted loneliness and despair, uh, because it was coming from somebody whose life was marked with loneliness and despair and a f pretty high level of narcissism. Um, and you see it, and it aches. His work aches because of it. But who? But we relate to the ache. Would you mind sharing the story of Caravaggio? Because that was personally, that chapter affected me greatly on, on a personal level. I, I, I connected with that on, on, on multiple levels. And, and I think it's, I think it's important. I think it's actually important, especially for when you're talking about the creation of Christian art, because one of the most fascinating parts about this thing is a lot of these guys were making the art that is held up now in the church as this great art. But the reason that it was connecting to people is it was because it was made by broken people. So it's reflecting the gospel because they were broken, not the other way around, which is just fascinating. So I wonder if you if wouldn't mind sharing the story of Caravaggio. So... um Part of the process for writing this book for me was I, I didn't know all of these stories before I decided to write about them. Um, so for me, uh, and this is one of the ways that you can learn to appreciate art, is to, um, when you encounter something that you like, just note that, hey, that's something I like. I'd like to know more about that. And then go learn more about it. Um, that's what happened with the Caravaggio chapter. When I was a child, I saw a painting, a, a reproduction of his painting The Incredulity of St. Thomas, which is um, Jesus and Thomas and two other disciples. And, and Jesus is putting Thomas's dirty finger into the open wound in his side um, after the resurrection. It's that, you know, that part of the Bible. And as a kid, I remember seeing that painting and feeling like I like I wasn't probably supposed to see that painting um, because of how, how um, grotesque it is. And yet at the same time being really curious about it and drawn to it. And so I knew I wanted to write about Caravaggio and I thought, well, I'll write about the, the incredulity of St. Thomas. I'll write about that painting. And then as I started to research, I realized pretty quickly, oh, that's not a major painting for him. Um, and really there's some other paintings that are, that are kind of more centrally known for being Caravaggio. But, but even with that, I was like, it's really the story of this guy's life that is, that is the story that helps you understand those other paintings. And that is that Caravaggio was a, uh, an extreme picture of a person who, who embodied both profound corruption and an understanding of transcendent grace. And it, and it came through in his life. One of his uh, biographers said, in, for Caravaggio, there was only carnival and Lent and nothing in between. Um, so Caravaggio was um, a murderer. Uh, he murdered at least two people, maybe three. Uh, he spent most of his artistic career trying to evade cap capture by Roman police who had a death warrant to put him to death because of um, people that he killed. And he, he, he would get these commissions to paint these altarpieces and he would paint them. And when he was working, he would cloister himself away and it would be just this focus time and he wouldn't be coming out and it would, you know. And then when he'd get his commission, he'd spend a month or two just 
carousing in the streets and getting in fights and drinking and um, and uh, you know, people would end up dead uh, from these fights that he'd get into. And and then he'd have to flee that area and they'd go to some other place in Italy and he'd paint for commission and go carousing and get into trouble and have to flee from the law again. And And his story is really a sad one. And one of the things I do in the chapter is I juxtapose these tragic, the tragedy of his life and his story with, okay, I'm going to tell you a terrible stretch of his life. And then at the end of that, I'm going to say, during this time, he painted, these are the paintings he painted. Um, and then after that, he fled from Rome to Naples. And when he was in Naples, he got into this fight and just, you know, killed this police officer and then had to go on the run. And while that was happening, he painted, you know, the incredulity of St. Thomas or, or the, you know, the conversion of St. Matthew or whatever. And, and, it was fascinating for me to think through, okay, here's a person who, um, he seems insufferable, miserable, lonely, jaded, um, self-centered, hungry for money, uh, indulgent of any appetite that came his way, and, and also uh, somebody who, when painting biblical scenes, had this profound insight into the meaning of the ministry of Jesus to broken people and to sinful people, um, to doubting people, to people who had a complicated relationship with Christ and yet also an actual relationship with Christ, like Matthew the tax collector or Thomas who doubted the Lord. Um, and uh, and so his life is this, is this kind of juxtaposition of while he is living this hard criminal existence, he's also producing these profoundly transcendent biblical proclamations of the ministry and faithfulness of Jesus to sinful and hurting people. And I, I, one of the things I love about that chapter is I don't know anybody who doesn't have some measure of the paradox of corruption and grace living inside of them. You know, we, we are all that way. Caravaggio happens to be a, a cartoon version of it, like a caricature of it, an exaggeration of it in some ways, um, even though it's a true story. Um, but, but it raises the question for me of, okay, what, what can disqualify somebody who seems to have a relationship with Jesus from the grace of Jesus, you know, because here's a person who, you know, when Jesus was talking to Pontius Pilate um, and Pilate said, are you a king? Um, Jesus says, I'm, I'm here to do the will of, of my father and those who hear my voice know me. And I look at Caravaggio's work and I, and I think, okay, this seems to be the work of somebody who knows Jesus, um, who knows him. Uh, and Jesus says they're mine, you know, those, and, and, and yet Caravaggio's life is this thing that most people would look at and say, there's no way, uh, that he was a recipient of the grace of God. And I, I wrote the chapter to, to linger on the puzzle of all that and to say, okay, so, so is there, is there a point where Caravaggio could have behaved a little better and thus been worthy of grace or, um, could he have been even worse and still been kept by the grace of Jesus? Because there's a, the, the, those, those are high-stakes questions uh, for all of us, you know. And, uh, and I'm not a universalist by any stretch, you know. I believe in salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. And, and, uh, and yet, um, I think uh, as a as a pastor and just as somebody who lives in the same world as everybody else um i i know people uh, and i know tendencies inside my own heart um where we have a, an incredible capacity to hurt each other uh and to disobey the clear teachings of scripture and yet the gospel of jesus christ his his life death and resurrection on behalf of those who believe Surely it can't be something that I can un I can't destroy the power of his ability to hold on to me, and so that's those are a lot of the questions that the Caravaggio chapter raises. What spoke to 
me about that chapter was, you know, so behind me, we have the ragamuffin gospel. Um, when we started hope, um, my meditation app, we have kind of a core group of, of five people that started this thing. And so we, we met before we started and we said, okay, what do we want this company to be? Um, and that was kind of one of our core, you know, guiding worldviews was I, we wanted to make a, a Christian product for broken people. And what I loved about this is I am drawn to, to wild people who, who have a wild heart for God, you know, and and it seems to me that at least some of the Bible you have Peter, um, you have David, these, these are wild men that are, um, bombastic, you know, they're maybe out of control, but God seems to, to love these passionate wild men. And I see that in, in Caravaggio. Why do you think that sometimes the wild men are, are, are the chosen vessels of God for, for certain types of truth? It's, you know, what I loved about him was that he was reflecting the heart of the poor people, the broken people, and that's what they connected with. Do you, why do you think God likes these, these wild men to impart his message? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, well, let, let's just rehearse it a little bit, right? You have, you have Abraham, um, who lied about Sarah being his wife and had a concubine and slept with other women. You have Moses, who murdered, um, the, you know, the, the soldier in Pharaoh's army and lied about it. And you have, um, you know, the, uh, Jacob, who the thing the the main thing we learn about him early on is he was a deceiver uh and he 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 wrestled with God David was a murderer and an adulterer Jonah resented um God telling him to go offer his, the Lord's forgiveness to a, a race of people that he hated uh you know Hosea um you know was was charged with with Taking a prostitute as his wife and and returning to her over having her return to him over and over again and him never leaving, um, you know Peter denied knowing Jesus. Paul wanted to see the church extinguished and um, oversaw the stoning death of Stephen. Like when you start when you start to do the math and you add it all up, um, it 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 is compelling to me that part of the message of the Lord in leading his people uh, into truth is to have it come from the mouths of people who have done the unthinkable. Because in that, in that, we have to say it can't be the righteousness of the person that makes them worthy of the love of God. It has to be the righteousness of God that makes a person worthy of his love. Uh, it has to be the mercy and the grace of the Lord working through imperfect vessels, um, in spite of their flaws, it has to be the Lord's work, not ours. Uh, and so even, you know, so with Caravaggio, that's one of the things that I'm reminded of in that is I, I just think here's, here's the Lord working to make his message known, to make his mercy and grace known, to make the compassion of Jesus known, um, through the life of this person who, on the one hand, um, has a list of terrible, terrible things he's done. But on the other hand, it's not that it's not any worse than stuff David did, uh, or stuff Moses probably did, or you know, um, Paul. You know, like it's it's just a different form of of brokenness and recklessness and being adrift in the world um, and trying to figure out you know where our where our security lies and where it comes from. And um, it, it's I, I'm encouraged by that deeply um because when i read the beauty of psalms for example they're written by david who he was he was a lot like caravaggio um where he had these this this deep affection for the lord and understanding of his compassion and and really saw god as his rescuer which caravaggio seemed to do too um but he also uh, believed his own press and, you know, treated people often or occasionally as, as, um, 
being beneath him and his life being more worthy than theirs uh, to carry on and and that sort of thing and so um so there's something there's something beautifully true about um the nature of the mercy of the lord and how he works through imperfect vessels so often all the time i love that you say at one point in the book that that when we ignore beauty we're ignoring something essential to God. I think there are a lot of people that would disagree with that. I wonder if you could explain that statement and then maybe address what they would feel as maybe something inconsequential, something um, extracurricular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, I would say if you disagree with that, just examine your own patterns of behavior. Um, do you listen to music? Do you watch films? Do you read books? Why? Um, you know, even even sports, uh, sporting events, we're, we're watching to see a team win, but really what we're watching is we're watching for the the batter to hit it out of the park, and we're watching for those moments of splendor. We're watching for, for um, you know, Jordan to dunk over three people, to have those moments where we say that was a thing of beauty. You know, the first thing we learn about God is that he's, or one of the first things we learn is that he's glorious. Um, and that, and that when Moses wanted to see him, God said, you can't, uh, because the glory will kill you. Uh, it's more than you can handle. And if we're serious about really wanting to know God, um, then there are uh, philosophers call them the three transcendentals that we pursue the 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 goodness truth and beauty um and in the west uh we're very we can be very pragmatic uh and so we can emphasize or focus on the truth and goodness part um just tell me what i need to know give me uh give me information that i may make an intellectual assent to truth uh Give me application. Tell me what I should go and do because this is true. Uh, so give me something when I walk out of the church service. Give me three things to go do this week. But when you look at the teachings of Jesus, he didn't teach that way. He didn't teach that way really at all. Uh, in fact, he withheld a lot of application. Um, what's the primary way that Jesus taught? It was through storytelling. It was through parables. We have a couple places in the Gospels where there are sermons from Jesus, the Mount, a sermon on the Mount and, and another place or two here or there. But the vast majority of his teaching um, is there was a man who fell among thieves, uh, you know, or, or those, those sorts of things. He would tell these stories. And part of what he's doing is he's not just giving you data. And he's not giving you data in order to then say, now, apply this data in this way. He's saying to the rich young ruler who asks a very pragmatic question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which on its surface is kind of a ridiculous question because nobody does anything to inherit, right? We we inherit because of who we are uh, in relation to you know, the one who gives, um, not because we earn it. Um, but he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he, and he tells him this story. Uh, and the rich young ruler walks away sad because he, because Jesus says, you know, get, just give everything away that you've got. Um, <laughs> and he does, and that's not a teaching that Jesus gives to everybody, but he gives it to this guy. Why does he give it to this guy? Because he's saying to this guy, the thing that's keeping you from inheriting eternal life is this insatiable desire that you have to possess everything now. Uh, and you have to let that go. You have to, you have to count your, your, your belonging to this world as, um, as something that, that is like a vapor and it, it can all go away, you know? And, uh, and I think about that. I think about Jesus' method of teaching. And part of what he's in doing is he's engaging with the heart and the imagination, and he's making us think through um, the layers of a story. And this all has to do with with beauty, um, is that part of what beauty is, is kind of is, is um, getting, at, getting at the layers beneath just data. Uh, and so, you know, so it's why... Um, lyrics to a to a song when they're read 
it's a very different impact than if you hear them sung, if you hear them in the context of the song. They move you differently. It's the same words, but what's happening is they've been, they've been encased in and, and, and uh, uh, delivered in a, in a beautiful way or in a haunting way or in a, um, um, a, 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 a rhythmic way with crescendo that, that, that affects us more deeply than just hearing the words themselves. And so, and we, but we live this way, like everybody lives this way. We, 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 you know, Rich Mullins, how was, what was the way he said it? Um, he, he said, uh, he described people as we, we dress like flowers and we eat like birds, you know? And I think I love that image of as much as pragmatic as we might want to be. And as, um, uh, outcome oriented as we, we might want to approach things and just give me the applications and the list of things to do and three steps toward a, you know, whatever. Um, the way of God with people, even with Abraham, you know, when God was making his covenant relationship with Abraham, he said, you're going to be the father of a nation. And Abraham said, my wife and I are barren. How's that even possible? Um, what did the Lord do? He didn't say, I want you to think of the biggest number you can think of. He said, I want you to go look at the desert sky. And anybody who's ever looked at a desert sky at night, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. And it, and it, it, it's mystifying and it's cosmic and it's, and it makes you feel so small and so privileged to be in the presence of something so spectacular. And, you know, asteroids fire across the sky and these little streaks of, of light. And that's what the Lord told Abraham to look at in order to imagine the nation that he would be the father of. And that's how the Lord engages with us. He, he calls us to engage with and interact with beauty and transcendence as a way of, of understanding things more deeply than just what the data alone would give. You know, I think what's hard about this is, you know, Hindsight's twenty twenty. We look backwards at, at these these artists and we see the totality of their life. We have their story from beginning to finish, and you say, "Wow, um, you know, you you see the good and the bad, and we can kind of make a judgment on on these people as they are." I think what's hard for people is to hold these ideas in their head as they experience them. Yeah, you know, I think. <laughs> I think part of the way I would answer that question is I think maybe we shouldn't think that much about them. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe we shouldn't wonder too much about the inner workings of other people's hearts. Um, I think we, we live in a time where we have such access to information. Um, so, so you and I are talking right now, uh, as this is being recorded, about three hours after the death of the queen. I know the queen died already, right? Because we live in a time where information is global, immediate, and free. And so it's hard for people not to know that the queen is already dead by this point because it's everywhere. If you open a social media app or if you look online or if you turn on a TV or, you know, or listen to a radio, get in your car, you're going to hear it. And I think... There is a, uh, you know, the, there's a passage in the New Testament, I forget which, which epistle it's in, but basically says aspire to live a quiet life. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think, I think one of the things that we, we, um, uh, one of the things that's hard about living in the era that we're in, and especially for young people, um, is we have just so much access to information that we really have no business knowing. Uh, and we have so much access to information that is so tragic and so weighty, and we have to carry it all around in our hearts in some way or fashion. We, you know, we know about wars that happen and, and mudslides and hurricanes and shootings and, um, all these different things. And on the one hand, I mean, it's, it's, it's a it's a privilege to be able to know about things that are happening in the world, but I don't think our hearts were meant to carry all of the information. And I think that's part of part of the um, the challenge right now of of um, 
of honoring the dignity and the personhood uh, of of image bearers of God is that um, we really turn each other into cartoons pretty quickly, um, or the information we get is so incomplete and so editorialized and so um, uh, focused that really we're, we're carrying around such impartial and in, incomplete information that it doesn't help us really at all to know the true story of another person. So... Um, <clears throat> That being said, I, I think, you know, I, 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 I want to always be careful to say if the information that we get about these people that are kind of being put forth as examples of, uh, you know, uh, examples of whatever that, that we that we we want to run. We want to remember that we're, we're not getting anything complete. It's a tricky spot because it's, it's I, you know, I, I see, especially younger people, and I would consider myself part of this. Um, I'll just use me as a personal example. This is a new show for us. Um, I, I, when I started this company, I wanted to create audio meditations because I thought it was something that could help people. Um, but I, I love audio. I love working in audio. And part of that was not showing my face. You know, I, and then my team was like, Hey, we need to get into video podcasting. This kind of where things are headed in this video. Um, and it, it bothers me, you know, I'm not like somebody that loves being in front of a camera. And I think the hard part, especially for young people is that you are looking at these young artists and part of what you say in your book is that you have to expose your wounds because when you expose your wounds, that's what people connect with. <clears throat> yeah. Talk about Van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear. That, that one of the things that's, you, you know, that if you know anything about Van Gogh, probably it's that he cut off his ear. Um, you know, like that's the thing, that's the lead story, right? For Van Gogh is he painted Starry Night and he cut off his ear. And that episode of him cutting off his ear was the, the lowest, most humiliating point in his life. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we know about it. But he, when he, he, he went into a, a, an insane asylum afterwards, um, as part of the recovery process. And while he was recovering, he painted himself twice with his bandaged side showing. And there's a, there's just such a, such a paradox there because, um, when you're painting, you can paint whatever you want, right? It's not a photograph. He, did, he could have painted the other side of his head that didn't have a bandage on it. Uh, he could have painted his ear intact, uh, even though it wasn't. But instead, he painted a picture of himself with his wound showing toward toward the viewer with the bandage over it. And so what I love about that, in fact, I'm, I'm reaching my hand, I'm touching uh, a framed print of it right now that's in my office that's right here. I keep it right above my desk. Because as a pastor, this is what I want to do with my people: is I want them to be, I want them to see the wounded parts of me. Um, because it, to withhold that is to withhold the need for the gospel. If my presentation to my congregation is, "I'm fine, everything's fine, I'm just here to minister to you all," um, I lose the credibility of having a voice in their lives when when they suffer. Um, the beauty of and the irony of Van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear is he captured on canvas the most shame-filled, humiliating point in his life, and now it is of incalculable worth. Um, that that you know, and that's us, right? Is is are we are wounded and we have our areas of brokenness in our lives, and yet at the same time, even as those are seen. Because we're made in the image of God, we have inherent dignity and incalculable worth given to us by our maker. Uh, and, and it's unassailable, you know, and, and so, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I was getting at with the, with the letting the wounds be seen as part of it is, it gets back to this idea of art that's true, that's honest. You know, this is, this is Van Gogh painting something that's honest. Uh, he could have painted himself, you know, like, like Napoleon on a horse if he wanted to, to try to give some sense of, I'm okay, everything's fine. And instead, he, he owns, his own fragility. Uh, and when we look at it, we can't look away. I, I think what's hard though is, you know, I have a camera on me and it's hard to know how much 
to share, right? And especially if you're looking at a young artist, they have the social media. I'm, I'm not a big social media person, but you have the social media. And then and you're talking about to create something that's true and, and that stands the test of time. You have to be honest and you have to expose these wounds. But we're in this weird spot where Aunt Van Gogh had the separation between the painting and he never saw it get monetized. We've, we've gotten to a point where we're almost monetizing wounds immediately, which is very strange. Yeah. And it's also, yeah. And that's a good point. That's something we have to be really careful with because, you know, we have to question uh, the, our, our motives and the appropriateness of how we share. Um, you know, like I, I have a, I have a pretty subdued relationship with social media. There are a few things I do on social media and other things that a lot of other people I know do on social media that I don't. Um, you won't find a lot of pictures of my children on social media. You won't find a lot of, you know, really personal stories on there. And it's not because I don't want people to know me personally. It's that I don't want Twitter to know me personally. Um, you know, Twitter doesn't need to know who I am uh, that much. They, you know, but my church knows a lot more about me than social media does. And the small group I'm a part of knows even more than that. And my wife knows it all, you know, and I think it's part of figuring out, okay, um, for what purpose are we being transparent with our lives and hearts? If it's for the sake of being known, uh, being encouraging, being part of community, an ongoing relationship with people we're walking through life with, then yes, you, you, you want those relationships to be ones of, of, um, gradual and increased disclosure. But if you're just putting yourself out there for the for the whole world, um, no holds barred, nothing off limits, it's worthy of asking the question: Why? What's the goal here? Um, is, is it something? Because because here's where it gets really twisted: Is what if after you do a lot of examination of your own heart, you realize that the goal is I want the world to think that I am this really transparent, honest um, picture of humility and wisdom, when in fact what you're just doing instead of vacation pictures on the beach is you're just curating a different narrative about yourself that may or may not be any more true uh, than the curation of somebody's Instagram that's just them traveling the world. I mean, you, we have so much control over the narrative that we that we put online that it's easy for us to come up, to present something to come across as wow, this guy, he's really deep, he's really smart, he's really he's, he's really, you know, done a lot of work. He's he's pretty in tune with himself. And really it's like, no, I just I just know that these are the things that that make people think that. And so I'm going to give you as much of that as as you want and go about my day. It's, you know, it's very odd. Um, and I'll, I'll even expose myself a little further here. So you talk about Van Gogh and you say he had a desire for admiration, um, but an inability to accept it. Mm -hmm. I think that is true of, of um, myself. I try to fight it as best that I can. I think that's true of most artists. And I don't know this. I, I presume maybe not for yourself, but for, for lots of pastors, that's, that's true of pastors as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder how you hold these ideas in your head, because largely we, we make the things that we make for the consumption of others. You made this book for the consumption of others. We film this podcast for the consumption of others. And it's ultimately to inspire, to entertain, to all these things, but it's made for others. We, part of us wants that admiration. And I guess I, I tend to do my best work when I can leave that. And I think about my desire to do this, um, to help people get closer to God, but to pretend that those desires don't exist is not true, you know, and it's, it's a hard balance to make things for people and then to kind of like hold them at a distance. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Anything, this is all a vanity project. All of these things are in some measure a vanity project. Um, now not in, not, it doesn't have to be in a gross way, but you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense for somebody to create something and put it out into the world if they have no desire for it to connect with other people or it's not something that they they feel like they have something valuable to bring. But God made us that way, right? He made us to be people who, you know, um, you know, one body, many parts is how Scripture talks about it. Um, 
the Psalms talk about often. They talk about wanting to grow in our knowledge of the Lord. And part of the ways that we function as, as human beings is we, we bring knowledge and experience to other people who don't yet have that knowledge or experience, and they bring the same to us. You know, there are some spheres of influence where we don't think twice about it. We want the doctor to really know a lot about medical things. We want the finance person to really understand how money works, you know, and, and we want the pastor and the theologian to, um, to have had some kind of formal training in, in theology and biblical studies, right? Like those are things that you want. I know that there are certain things that I can say from the pulpit that will maybe be helpful, but mostly be said to impress. Uh, one of the things that we we learn in seminaries, we learn how to use Greek and Hebrew, you know, and so as a preacher, um, on any given Sunday, I could use Greek and Hebrew words and I could talk about them grammatically and I could get into there, you know, and do I have to? No, I could just say, um, in the original Greek, this word means this. That's what I could say. Or I could say, well, the Greek word is pronounced this way, and then I could get you know do the, and and there's a certain point where, at least for me as a pastor, I know when I'm flexing uh, in the pulpit, and I don't like the feeling. I know when I'm saying something to um, get people to think a certain way about me, or or to garner some sort of some sort of respect or something like that. And I think that's a discipline that that I need to continually want to grow in. And I think we all should, you know, of, of, I do have valuable things to bring to the conversation. I, as a pastor, I feel like part of my calling is to serve the local church, but is also to kind of speak to the church at large, uh, in much the same way that a physician will have, a, have their practice, but they'll also maybe contribute articles to medical journals. You know, that there's a, that there's a, um, that I occupy a role in society as a clergyman, where part of my sphere, part of my area of influence and study is things related to religion and theology and scripture. And so I'm all about putting things out there into the world that, that are part of that vocational calling. Um, but I think it's a, it's a line where we, we all need the discipline of examining, okay, am I doing this to, to help add something meaningful to the conversation? And to what degree am I also doing this to uh, inflate people's perceptions of me? Um, and I, personally, I think if we will, if we're willing to ask the question of ourselves, we probably aren't going to have that much of a difficult time discerning when and where we're just trying to um, inflate our own egos and, and, you know, up our own, um, uh, increase our own popularity, uh, as, as influencers. What a weird thing to live in a time of influencers. I mean, it says weird. nothing, right? It just all an influencer is if you're just, if, if the only thing that people know about you is that well, that person's an, an influencer, all it means is they have lots of people that follow them on social media. It doesn't say anything about their qualifications to speak to subjects, to, you know, a range of subjects. It doesn't say anything about that. It just says, oh, they just have the ear of a lot of people. So, um, you know, okay. I don't know if that's valuable. Like, you know, like when, when I was thinking about pr promoting the art book, because we, we promote, you know, when you write a book, you, you want to get influencers to tell their people about it. And, uh, about half the names that I could have put on that list, I didn't because I just thought this is this is nowhere near what they do or or what their pre online presence is. It has nothing like I, I would feel duplicitous in even asking them to to share about my book with the people that you know they influence. I guess I don't know. It is a very very odd time to have these people that are wildly famous for no discernible reason. Which is which is part of the beauty of, of art, right? Is art has this way of um, establishing its its uh, credibility by just lasting. So uh, for example, 
Um, there's a there's an old anecdote about an art student who goes to the Louvre and sees the Michael uh, sees the Mona Lisa, and he stands and he looks at it for a while, <clears throat> and he says to the docent in the room, "I just don't get what the big deal is." And the docent says, "Son, that's the Mona Lisa." The art student doesn't judge the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa judges the art student. And I think that's that's a fair point, um, that you, you can't just, you know, walk into the room where Michelangelo's David is standing and say, that's terrible, um, because 500 years of human history will tell you you're wrong. Uh, now, art is subjective, but... The 500 million people or whoever have gone into that room to stand in front of that statue are telling you that, um, yeah, it's subjective, but there's also something objectively that has happened with this sculpture that ought to humble you uh, in your uh, immediate assessment of, of whether it's worth anything or not. And uh, that's that's one of the reasons I love writing about art is because I don't have to I don't have to apologize for devoting an entire chapter to Caravaggio or Van Gogh or Henry Tanner um, because they don't need me to establish them as some of the world's greatest artists who have produced some of the world's greatest art. That's already established. I get the luxury now of telling you about them, uh, and you can do with that what you will. Um, but I'm not trying to get anybody to. Um, to accept them as some of the greatest artists in the world because that's already happened. That ship has sailed. Do you, in your heart of hearts, you believe that art is um, subjective? Yeah, to a degree. I don't believe it's purely subjective. Because I, I guess w where I kind of draw that line is you see a lot of, especially postmodern art, is that they say if the art makes you feel something, even if it's disgust or... Um, bad that it is art and you know i i'm a, i i like jackson pollock i like you know i like kind of this this postmodern um some of that stuff but some of it i i have to imagine that there has to be some level of you have to draw the line somewhere it can't be fully subjective so a number of years ago i went to the metropolitan museum of art in new york and as I was making my way through, I was in the room with the Rembrandts and Caravaggio, the Dutch and Italian Renaissance painters, Vermeer, and everybody in the room was quiet, hands behind their backs, looking at paintings, nobody saying anything to anybody. It's kind of a solemn. And then I go down the stairs and around the corner, and I'm in the room with Picasso and Warhol and, and um, Pollock and Rothko and people like that. Everybody's talking. Everybody's talking uh, to strangers. Strangers are talking to each other. And I have a friend who is, who's an art history guy, and I said, what was going on there? Like, I noticed this. What was happening? And he said, he said, well, you, you noticed the, um, the, the change in art after the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution. He said, he said the, the art before that, uh, that when you, the Dutch Renaissance people, their art exists to tell you things. Um, they're making statements to you. They're 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 declarative. But when you go and you look at some of this modern art, it's interrogative. It's asking questions. It's raising questions. And part of its purpose is to throw you off. Is to upset you. So you know. So you see Warhol, who has these screen silk screens of Marilyn Monroe and Elvis. Um, but then he also had a giant silkscreen of Mao, the, the, you know, the chairman of China, and, and he, he, treated in the exact same way as, as a pop culture celebrity. And part of what he was trying to say, and this was with the soup cans too, is who gets to decide what's art or not art? Um, it, and when he did the soup cans, he was kind of pushing the limit of saying, if I, as a celebrated artist do a silk screen of a bunch of Campbell's soup cans, the world is going to receive this as a work of art. Is it? And why? Why would you say that it is or, or isn't? Um, you know, I think the great thing about museums is there's a little curation that happens. I think people can make things and call it art and, and um, 
and we may wonder, is this really art or is this, does this have any kind of meaning at all? But by the time it's, it's been curated to where it's placed in a museum, um, that tells me anyway that, that there's something about it that has, um, that has passed a smell test to say it's worthy of being considered. And, uh, and I think even art that is, uh, inflammatory art that is things that would offend me as a Christian, part of the point of it is that I am engaging with a statement that is being made and the way it is being made. Um, and now I'm having to wrestle with if this upsets me, why? Um, what is it that I disagree with about in this in this piece of art, or what is the question that it's asking that makes me uncomfortable to ask? It's a very val- valid form of art criticism to stand in front of a painting and say I like this, uh, and it's an equally valid form of art cr- criticism to stand in front of something and say I don't get this one or I don't like this one, um, and uh, I think that's that's part of it. But but yeah, I'm going to think about that. When I first started getting into art, um, I was probably middle school, early high school, and I liked um, early Shepard Fairey when he was doing all the Andre the Giant Obey stuff. I liked a lot of David Cho, um, you know, and I still I still like David Cho, but but I think what attracted me to those people at least at that point in my life was the attitude. It was almost like a punk rock attitude. You had graffiti artists and, you know, they were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. And that's what attracted me. Do you think that ideas and attitudes can be encompassed as maybe the art doesn't last, but it's the attitude of it. Can that be art or is there, is there have to be a level of skill or an objective standard to kind of measure it against? Well, I think about um, I think about Banksy, um, the graffiti artist, uh, and I I think part of what what helps an artist um, sort of rise to the level of of being one that we'll be talking about for generations is is not just a thing a, a work of art that they make here or there but but when you look at the body of work that they've created what are they saying with the whole of it and we do this musicians with musicians too springsteen paul simon um you know you 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 look at the body of work as a whole at a certain point um and um you know banksy is fascinating fascinating to me because he's un, he, he's unknown he doesn't show his face he, he's a graffiti artist. He, he shows up all over the world. His work shows up all over the world. I, I do a series on Wednesdays called Art Wednesday, um, where I, on my social media posts, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, I devote the entire day to posting a series of paint, <clears throat> paintings that are either all by the same artist or connected in some way. And coming up, I have, I'll, I have a focus on Banksy um, and his, his work, and I have these different pictures of, of murals, graffiti murals that he's done around the world. Um, but he, he has this very famous image of a little girl holding a heart-shaped balloon. There was a painting, a, a copy of it, that was framed uh, by Banksy that was being sold at, this, at a Sotheby oxygen, or Sotheby's auction. And, um, and it went for, you know, over a million dollars. And when the gavel went down, after the highest bidder bought the painting, the frame started to vibrate and the picture inside the frame started to come out the bottom of the painting through a paper shredder. And so it, it, it and what Banksy had done is he had built a paper shredder that was remote control operated into the frame so that he could sell this image that was that he was famous for, but his images were all about um, the the horrors of capitalism. Uh, you know, somebody spends a gross amount of money to him on this painting, and after they've purchased it, the frame that he put it in devours it. And it's just kind of it was this beautiful like like moment of 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 art artistic genius. And it, the, the shredder bound up when it was ha- almost halfway through shredding the paper. And so half of it, about a third of it was still in the frame, and the other two-thirds of it were just kind of hanging out the bottom of the frame there. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, 
the uh, art community said now it's worth double uh, what it was before the person bought it because it's now it's 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 performance art, you know. Um, but I look at I look at stuff like like that, and I think whether you agree or disagree with the overall message of what he's trying to say, he's using art to come at it in as many different ways as he possibly can to keep saying the same thing. Um, we're not made for war. Capitalism will destroy your soul if you let it. You know, um, innocent, innocence is being stolen from children because of, of our use of money and our use of weapons. You know, things like this that, that, are, that are part of what, he, what, what, what is his overall message. And I, I, I find that, that Sotheby's auction to just be, I mean, just what a moment. What a moment. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it actually happen on YouTube. Oh, really? I, I, yeah, I, I love the Banksy. Video. Just kind of watching the time here. Would you mind sharing the story of the Rembrandt painting being stolen? That was a, a totally new story to me, and I think a lot of people will will uh, find that very entertaining. Well, this story is really the impetus behind the book. Uh, so this was the first chapter that I wrote for the book, and I really wrote it as an essay to be delivered at a lecture, uh, as a lecture at a conference, and. Um, it's the story of Rembrandt's painting The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, which is one of it's my favorite Rembrandt painting. And um and in 1990 uh, on St. Patrick's Day uh in Boston. So St. Patty's Day in Boston. Um that painting was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum along with 12 other priceless works of art including a Vermeer, a couple of Degas, some Manets, and and they haven't been seen since. So that was 1990. Uh, that's like 32 years ago or something. Um, there's a five million dollar bond on the on reward for their return. Nothing. They've gotten it and they've gotten nothing. Um, that particular painting uh, is a, a large scale painting, and the thieves who dressed up as Boston police officers to gain access to the museum at night. Uh, they they got the guards to buzz them in, and then they tied up the guards and put them in the basement and spent the night taking art out of the museum. Um, to get that particular painting out, they cut it out of the frame with a box knife. And Isabella Stewart Gardner, the woman who made that museum, that was her personal collection of art that she and her husband had collected. And she designed this museum after her husband died as a way of trying to preserve something uh, that would last. And one of the uh, stipulations that she put in the trust for that museum was that the collection could never change, that you couldn't add to it and you couldn't take from it. And if you did, uh, then the whole thing would have to be liquidated and given to Harvard, uh, Harvard University. And so, um, so when that painting was cut out of its frame, because of that rule, they couldn't take the frame off the wall. And so if you go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston today, you can go into the room where that painting was cut out of its frame and the frame is still there. Uh, it's still there on the wall. And what fascinates me so much is the, the subject matter of that painting is the disciples in the boat with Jesus in this storm and Jesus is sleeping and they're frantically trying to wake him up to ask him the question. And the question that they ask him is, don't you care that we're perishing here? And Rembrandt painted himself into that painting as the 13th disciple, and he's in the middle of the boat, and he's looking out at the viewer. And so at some point, there's this thief dressed as a police officer with a box knife eye to eye with Rembrandt as he's cutting him out of the frame. And Rembrandt is asking him, don't you care that we live in a world like this? Don't you care that we we live in a world where where things are consumed uh, in terrible ways and and that we're perishing here? Doesn't it matter to you? And and I just found that to be such a poignant thing that 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 Rembrandt is asking us the question as the disciples are asking Jesus that question, and he would have been nose to nose with that with that thief as he's cutting that painting out of out of that. And I don't know if the thief knew the story of of that. Bible passage or not, um, but it's fascinating to think about how um, the irony of of 
what that painting, the message of that painting and what those thieves did to it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a heartbreaking story. And, um, you know, it's, it's been 32 years now. I, my, my suspicion is that it's been destroyed, um, because in, people don't leave money on the table, um, you know, for that long. And if, if anybody knows about it and there's $5 million to get as a reward for its return, um, something would have happened by now. And that's my, that's my feeling about it. I don't know. I hope I'm wrong. I doubt, I doubt that I'm wrong, but I hope that I'm wrong, um, on that. But yeah, that's the story behind that, behind that painting is, is the museum itself was meant to be something that would last. And these thieves came in, they broke it and stole. And it, and now it's not what it was. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's, there's a lot of the human condition just in that story alone. Yeah, I hope you're wrong as well. It's a beautiful painting. Um, I know we are out of time here, and, and I'll ask you one final question. And, and you can answer this in, in whatever capacity that you feel comfortable answering. Um, you know, you can kind of sense when when somebody is writing um, something personal. This book to me reads as something personal. The the way that you write about pain and brokenness, this feels while you're writing about other people's stories, this feels like your story in a way. I I wonder um if you would feel comfortable sharing is this is this writing about pain and brokenness a personal thing to you? And, and then I guess maybe how does that bleed into the the book itself because it, it's it's a beautiful book but it it reads to me as somebody that is that knows something you know that somebody who has been there you know um yes it's it's of course it's very um autobiographical in in a lot of ways um it's about more than pain uh it is about a Maybe I would say it this way. It's about a lifelong relationship with art and the way that art has helped me in seasons of suffering um, and the way that art has helped me in general when it comes to the brokenness of this, of this world, that it's a counterpoint to the ugly. Uh, it's a counterpoint to the perishing, you know, that, that art is something that is you know, <clears throat> even though there will come a day when, you know, Van Gogh's work will um, decay, uh, it hasn't yet, and it won't for a long time. You know, and and um, <clears throat> you know, I've 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 been through suffering. Um, I've suffered personal things, medical things, relational things. I've lost people. Um, I've also. Uh, <clears throat> by nature of just the life that I've lived and, and the work that I do, I've, I've had lots of opportunity to see people walk through seasons of great suffering and come out on the other side, um, having grown, having matured, having, gaining insights into, um, <clears throat> what it means to be human and what it means to have need uh, in ways that have uh, profoundly helped. You know, as a, as a pastor, when I when I stand up on Sunday morning and I look out into the congregation, I've been with this congregation now almost four years, and there's so many stories that I know of people's sorrows and pains, of rebellious children and struggling marriages and medical diagnoses and job questions and, and um, miscarriages and... Um, childhood trauma and things like this and i think i think there's the, the, it's a sacred thing to um to know those stories it's a sacred thing to have the privilege of walking with people in those stories and i think one of the things that i i love about the power of art is i think art comforts the afflicted um it 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 has a way of saying things that are true and meaningful to people um, that we carry around with us in our in our hearts uh, and in our minds and our imaginations as we remember and art has always been a a, uh, a 
of great comfort to me because of because of the way that it um, so much of it anyway uh, uh, speaks truth into the 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 struggle um, whether it's on the canvas or in the life of the person who put it there well I appreciate you uh, you've you've definitely helped me um, I have the book here Rembrandt is in the wind everybody should go check it out um, honestly it, it is not just for art lovers it is for um, anybody that wants to see the world differently I, I genuinely, genuinely recommend it. I always, uh, my dad, when he buys books, he highlights like every word and it drives me nuts. And I always <laughs> tell him like, why are you highlighting so much? But in your book, I mean, you can see on this one page, I underlined almost everything written. I mean, that's just a random page that I open to. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing book. Um, Russ, you're a great writer and I appreciate you coming on the program and Thank coming you. on the podcast. Thank you very much, Taylor. I appreciate it. If you'd like to check out Russ's book, Rembrandt is in the Wind, we're going to link to it in the show notes. If you want to learn more about Russ and his other books, you can check out his website, russ-ramsey.com, or you can go and follow him on Instagram at russramsey1. I actually um, recommend that you guys go check him out on Instagram. He does these like mini art stories where if you like today's episodes, he'll put up a piece of art and he'll kind of tell you the history of the piece of art. And it's a lot of fun to to learn these new things. And it's, it's kind of an extension of, of the talk we had today. 